we will kick this off and we want to welcome you all and we want to say thank you for joining us for this call to talk about youth mental the youth mental health crisis and the impact it has on young adults especially those in college and uh, joining us today to help talk about that are Linda Hall, the director of the Wisconsin Office of Children's Mental Health, Amy Marsman, the OCMH senior research analyst, Maya, who is a student at UW-Whitewater, and James, a Thomas Edison State University student. And we'll begin today with remarks from OCMH director Linda Hall and research analyst Amy Marsman. Then we will hear from our student guests and open this up to your questions. So we'll get started right now with Linda Hall. Linda. Good afternoon. Uh, as the director of the Office of Children's Mental Health, I just want to provide a little context as to what our office is. We are a statewide office that is concerned with youth mental health. We uh, follow the data related to children's mental health and we collaborate with stakeholders to improve children's well being. In our work, we are concerned with youth ages 0 to 26. And we consider mental health challenges for youth at the different stages of, the, of this uh, life spectrum. Today, we're focusing on college students. So what youth tell us is that academics and school demands are at the top of their list of stresses for them. Other concerns that we hear from them are climate change, gun violence, and political divisiveness. So today we're going to talk about school pressures and the academic and academic stress and we're doing that today because October is really when these stresses start to accumulate for students. Research tells us that there are uh, practical ways of coping with stress and today we're going to highlight three of them. Taking time for friends, getting involved in extracurricular activities and identifying coping skills that work for you. Now I'm going to turn it to Amy Marsman, our research analyst, who's going to share the data behind these important tips. Thank you, Linda. Yes, we know from research that there are healthy ways of managing stress and effective ways to improve mental health. Regarding friendships, our first tip, um, we know that friends are a protective factor. That is, when you have healthy, positive friendships in youth and young adulthood, it actually protects your mental and physical health. And the benefits of quality friendships last well into adulthood. Studies have shown that um, this powerful effect of peers goes beyond health and wellness. In fact, peer relationships can impact, even impact future employment and salary. And that's over 40 years later. So um, these effects the research found were stronger than the effects of IQ, socioeconomic status, and educational attainment. Researchers think that these long-lasting effects might occur because of the reciprocal nature between kids' social experiences and their biological development happening at the same time. Um, but friends are also key to managing stress in the short term. Young people as you likely know, are most likely to turn to their friends and peers first when having a bad day or during any challenging time. For youth, their friends are their default social support. So having strong friendships will really help, help you cope with life's challenges in the short term and the long term, both big and small. Regarding extracurricular activities, here research demonstrates that being involved in an extracurricular is associated with better mental health outcomes and a stronger sense of school belonging. And school belonging in turn in, uh, um, has a positive effect on mental health as well. Students in extracurriculars are less likely to report depression, less likely to report anxiety compared to students who are not. And this holds true for activities that are um, not based within the school. It can be any activity that fosters a connection or is related to an interest and a passion. So music, sports, theater, dance, volunteering, community service, any activity that creates a connection has been found to be effective. And our last tip is on um, coping skills. Here, research shows that coping skills can be learned at any age and resiliency is a, mu a muscle that grows over time. There are countless research studies showing the effectiveness of various coping skills, everything from exercise, being outside in green spaces, practicing meditation, writing, journaling, walking, sleeping, volunteering, and unplugging from social media. Each of these have been shown to be effective at reducing stress and improving well-being. 
So those are just a very brief review of some of the evidence around friendships, being involved in activities and um, practicing coping skills that makes a difference in health and wellness. Um, I just wanna say we're highlighting these not to add more to a college student's busy plate, but rather to show how effective everyday habits can be for your mental health. And I'll turn it back over to Linda. Thanks, Amy. So young people, what we really want to encourage you to hone in on what works for you. And go, as Amy said, incorporate these into your daily life. Research shows you'll be in a better position to handle the setbacks uh, and weather the life's challenges. And but you know, today we don't want to talk just about research. We know that real life experience is important too. And so next we're going to hear from a couple of college students on what works for them and how they manage stress. Yeah, Linda, absolutely. Thank you for that. And um, why don't we get to look, get to uh, James first, know a little bit more about James. How has college and, and the stress of classes impacted your mental health? Well, at first, uh, things started pretty rough. Um, I had a lot of uncertainty going into college because so, some past educational uh, situations just didn't go so well. Uh, so when I was getting into a, a new environment or a new situation, I would often jump to the, jump to the negative or just not have the, the confidence in myself. Uh, there's also a lot going on the past several years, uh, many different distractions I would often find myself on. Uh, on scrolling through social media or different news feeds instead of uh, focusing on what I wanted to. And at, at times uh, that became kind of a kind of a negative coping approach. Uh, it took time to really develop the uh, more productive and positive ways to, to cope with the stress of school. Uh, some, and often uh, when I would have some kind of setback or something that, that just didn't go right or was a, a challenge or a, a barrier, I would often start to catastrophize. I didn't always have the, the people and, and the thought pattern to say, hey, you know what, there's another way. The world isn't over, we'll get through this. Um, but eventually I did find those, those peers through, uh, through intentioned uh, participation and, and, and outreach and, and connections. I found ways to, to, to manage my academics and, ma and manage what I was doing. And overall, I think college uh, opened up a lot of doors for me, not just in what I learned, but also um, in how I developed as a person. James, that's great. Thank you for sharing that. Um, let's go now to Maya. And Maya, what do you think about the tips that we talked about? And which activities leave you feeling best? Yeah, so I am a big fan of exercise, um, exercise and journaling. I like to exercise at least two to three times a week from um, just the different postures that I have to go through, like for taking notes or um, yeah, just my hands, I find myself being extremely tense. So exercising is a wonderful way to just relieve that tension, uh, loosen up a bit. As for journaling, um, yeah, I like to journal every night after, especially after long days. Um, I think of it as like a wind down time, relaxation time. It helps me really just um, release, process emotions and to um, just feel more connected and self-aware. And um, as for the friends and connections component, um, social isolation, especially for long uh, periods of time is just, can be very detrimental. I've experienced that myself and it is so, so, so vital to be around um, and to have a support system and to just have contact with others, like um, the motivation that it gives you, um, the strength that you get just from having a sense of community can go an extremely long way. That's great. Thank you so much for that. Um, we will now turn to our media partners, and I think we're going to have time for at least one question and a follow-up from each, and then we'll see where we are. Um, and we'll start with Pranav from the Daily Cardinal. Hi, my name is Pranav. Um, so uh, I'd just like to ask you about the general state of um, mental health in Wisconsin. Well, we focus on the, the um, mental wellness of youth, as I said, from zero to 26. And we note that the data are showing us that an increasing number of young people are um, experiencing anxiety and depression. This is a trend that's been um, on the upward swing for more than a decade. 
Um, and so that that we're focusing on that. Our approaches right now to this um, disturbing trend is to really focus on the social connectedness of youth and to um, amplify youth voice and how we should address this youth mental health crisis. Um, and what do you think is driving the recent uh, spike in mental health um, conditions? Well, we know that there are a, a number of reasons. Um, a primary reason for mental health uh, challenges for young people is this the stress that they and their families are under. So to the extent that families are under financial stress, um, that's, that's an issue. Uh, as we noted earlier, um, youth are telling us that uh, academic stress, uh, stress about thinking about their career um, and pressures related to that is uh, a very important issue for them. They also identify climate change, gun violence, political divisiveness. And we would add to that social media that um, folks really need to um, curate their social media. Um, think about using it in ways that uh, help you be better, feel better, uh, and stay away from the, the parts of, media, of social media that really um, can bring you down and cause depression. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, the next question goes to Natalie at USAGNA Network. Natalie, are you on the call? All right, I don't see Natalie. We'll try to get back to her. And we go now to Kelly at Milwaukee Journal Sentinel. Kelly? How about Crystal? Crystal from WXOW. Yes. So my question is, I think recently incoming freshmen, especially those who have been impacted by isolation from the pandemic, we're, or at least I'm seeing as I talk with incoming college students that social anxiety plays a big part into some of them not being able to make friends when they're off at college or joining those groups or extracurricular activities. So I guess, are there any tips to kind of tackling that or things people with social anxiety should be doing? I'll jump on this. Um, as I discovered, I found that uh, participating uh, in peer connections and overcoming that social anxiety really requires an intentioned effort. Uh, in my, my first year or two of college, I would just kind of go through a lot of the, the courses and, and the forums and, and the activities, uh, but I didn't really stop and, and take time to make those relationships, talk to people. Um, like a lot of my, my classmates, I would just you know, do the work and, and, and close my browser and move on. Uh, and you don't make social connections that way. It, it takes some, some time. Uh, and right now, uh, th these kind of social norms beyond those interactions are, are, are not really there. A lot of my, my peers and I didn't really know how, how to do that. Uh, so it is helpful to, one, make space and make opportunities for social connections to form. Thank you, um, and I don't have a follow-up. Okay, thank you, Crystal. Uh, Jeremy at WQOW, Jeremy. Hi, thank you. Yeah, so I know you guys primarily focus on zero uh, ages zero to 26, but on the latter half of that age group, not having these types of skills that you guys are talking about, you know, what does that do towards the tail end of that age group that you guys look at as far as, you know, life right after college or your junior, senior year, getting development? Uh, how does that kind of impact and, you know, hurt that development towards that later half as you're going on to, your, you know, adult age in your career? Yeah, thanks for that question. I think that uh, Amy addressed that a bit when she talked about um, some of the skills that kids need that carry them well into it, carry into adulthood and serve them well in adulthood. Really, that it, because of this issue that you're raising is the reason that we um, try to look at what's happening to young people all the way up to age 26, because we know that the skills, the coping skills, um, the ability to make friends, have connections, that all those things are important for those young adult years. We also know that um, 
youth who have a significant mental illness and are being served by the children's mental health system have to transition into the adult system, which doesn't offer as much support and um, is more difficult to access. So um, we definitely we know that uh, youth who uh, uh, engage, who become um, young adults, in a more positive state, a more a better state of mental wellness, are going to fare better in terms of career and everything that they need to do to um, launch a successful adult life. Thank you, and I don't have a follow up either. Thank you, Jeremy. Uh, we go now to John at NBC Twenty Six. Hi, thank you all for being here. <clears throat> I think my question is for. Linda, a, a lot has been made of academic catch up for young people who fell behind during the pandemic. And it's been talked about, you know, our two speakers here, thank you for sharing to sort of putting yourself out there. So Linda, is there anything that, you know, on the society level is trying to be done to help young people have a social catch up, if you will, catch up on some of those social skills that maybe weren't learned? Yeah, there is a lot of concern about the academic catch up that's needed. But, you know, what as we engage with educators, um, we're really hearing that they they believe they that they need to stop and take the time to work with kids on um, the social aspects and on the traumas that they're bringing to school. We hear over and over that kids have um, traumas they've experienced, some caused by the pandemic, some caused by poverty, um, other family circumstances, and that if we really, we have to make space for um, kids to address those and for the adults around them to help them do that. So we really um, are encouraging schools to make space for um, the school staff to support kids, to work on that those um, issues around uh, climate at school and belonging because those are really key to, the, to this whole issue. And are there any specific examples that you're aware of that, that schools that are succeeding in this are putting into place? Well, one thing that we're really encouraged about is that we have identified that there are um, more than 300 schools throughout the state that have a youth-led mental wellness program. So they are, um, so youth in the school are leading a program um, that might be NAMI Raise Your Voice, it might be Sources of Strength, uh, Red Gen or Hope Squad. These are all programs where, where students get engaged in um, talking about mental health, increasing people's mental health literacy and addressing um, school climate and helping kids I know where to go for help. We hear that a lot from youth, that they wanna know um, how, they, how to help their peers. So um, th this is really exciting. So we are really looking to capitalize this and, and really increase this youth voice because we know this is what's really gonna make a difference. We also know that we need to um, allow youth to lead in this whole area of how do we address the crisis because they are experiencing things that no generation before them has has experienced. So uh, that's that's really what we're intending to do in an even bigger way as uh, we wrap up this year and move into 2024. Thank you. Samantha. Hi, yes. Um, so I want to start by just addressing James and um, you know, just honestly, both of you, just as students, um, I myself, I'm 22, but I just graduated from college back in May. So fresh out of college, I understand just as di how difficult it is to find those friends that make you feel like you can do anything. And also just finding ways to cope with the immense stress of everything that comes with being a college student. Um, you know, I found myself going on walks around campus to help myself kind of put myself out there. I wasn't very extroverted when I first started college. So just if you could touch on like what it is like being a college student nowadays in today's climate. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll start first. Uh, I'll say that 
Uh, today, there's a, there's a lot of different other learning opportunities uh, in, in college. The way that the college works has, has shifted dramatically uh, through, due to technology over the past uh, decade or so. Uh, so actually, I started college in, in 2020, and I've done everything except for uh, some exam sessions online. Uh, one, on one hand, that has really dramatically opened up uh, opportunities for me to, to learn in, in different ways and styles and schedules that I wouldn't have done before and actually end up working very well for me. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, that completely changed uh, the, the, the social atmosphere, the, the interactions and, and the relationships I formed there. A lot of what you see in, in popular media about you know, the kind of the, the college experience, that doesn't really happen in an online environment. Uh, there's a lot of different ways that you can get involved but it's, it's very easy to, to not get involved and, 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 and not participate and engage a whole lot. Yeah, I'll add to that as well. So I would say based on the transition from um, things going and being completely online to, you know, opportunities and activities opening back up in person, there are um, clubs and student organizations that are more than excited to be able to host things in person again. Like we talked about with that contact one another, with one another, excuse me, especially in person, people are excited to be able to get back into the groove of like planning events and having, and like the actual promotion, the physical promotion of it all. Um, the most important aspect of that is, especially if you're attending a bigger university, find an organization or a club that fits your interests. A really great way to practice your social skills is to find something that you actually, um, you, you can find yourself be dedicated to or find something that you're especially interested in. Um, like James talked about, it can be very easy to slip into um, just staying online and keeping to yourself, but because of the, the opening with um, being able to be in person with things once again, it has made things a lot easier. Um, to be able to put yourself out there. Obviously easier said than done, but there are plenty of opportunities. You just have to be intentional, like James said. Yeah, thank you both. Um, just my follow-up would just be, you know, maybe just your what your message would be to really moving forward, not only raise awareness about this just very real mental health crisis in our generation, and but also to protect that mental health and tips on making it, really making it a priority. Uh, my message is to reach out, whether you know, you're in need of, of help or assistance or support or, or, or some love, uh, or if you see someone around you that is in a situation that's not great, reach out, start a, start a supportive conversation. Uh, regardless of, of who you are, what where you're from, what you're interested in, there's probably a community out there for you. Uh, I struggled to find my space a bit at first, but actually I found some student organizations, uh, some different support groups, support networks that end up being very helpful for me as I, as I went through different struggles or trials and tribulations or, or even helped me celebrate my successes when I had plenty of those. Uh, so that's, that's my key message. Reach out. Uh, don't be afraid to, to, to connect, to, to talk to start building those relationships. I completely agree um, with James there. It is extremely vital to be able to reach out to someone else, uh, regardless if it's just one person, even if it's just a professor that can also um, put you onto the different resources that are available on your campus. And um, one thing that is an extremely important to remember is that in order for you to feel killed cared for, you have to feel seen as well. And you have to put your set, yourself in those spaces that you can um, be seen. So, yeah. Thank you guys. Wonderful. Um, let's go now to uh, WISC. Uh, Logan, are you on the call? WISC, do you have a question? Okay, not hearing not hearing from them. We do have questions that were sent in to us. So we're gonna run over to those real quickly. And James and Maya, you both talked about this a little bit, but do you wanna elaborate at all on what steps do you take to make time for friends and extracurriculars? Yeah. So when I you know, kind of get 
thinking about everything I had going on with all of my, my classes, my assignments, my exams, my organizations and other community events, it can get very overwhelming. I can have a sense of this overwhelming doom and that something is going to crash down or I'm going to forget something. The key thing I have there was to schedule, to organize, to, to write it out, talk it out with someone, because uh, talking with someone can help me realize, hey, you know what, maybe you don't need to do this. Maybe this is more important. You need to put some more effort on this. Maybe you're, you're a bit too uh, you know, anxious or fearful about this thing. Uh, another thing that I really found helpful is blocking out time. I set aside a day each week intentionally to, to care for myself and, and do everything that my body and mind needs to reset and refocus and recharge and don't allow really other things to get in there to distract me and, and, and set my energy that allows me to return fresh to all the activities that I uh, want and need to do for the rest of the week. I do the same thing as James. I keep a um, weekly planner to keep my life organized. I like to say that my calendar is my brain because sometimes there's just a lot to, uh, to handle and juggle. So um, you gotta honestly take the time, sit with someone, um, prioritize the different tasks that um, you have at hand. Because once you realize, okay, this is actually more important to me than I realized, or ah, I can actually put this down lower in my list. It helps you really um, have a sense of confidence and feel more organized in your life and just your overall schedule. Wonderful. Uh, the next question we have is, what is one thing that colleges could do to support youth mental health? Uh, in my mind, it's all about engagement, uh, building interactivity, relationships, connections. Uh, students right now, there are a lot of them are, are socially anxious, they're shy, they're not sure how to, to start building these pure relationships. Uh, so I think colleges really need to go in and, and help students st start building these up again. Uh, start whether it's in a in a student organization or a club or just other industry uh, field get togethers or just just fun events uh, get students talking get students uh, meeting each other meeting people in their field uh, getting things to get excited about or or involved in uh, just get students together and in, in interacting another thing i would suggest is to raise awareness about the available services and resources that they have on campus. Um, I don't think that the problem is the awareness piece because I feel like universities and colleges typically um, do a great job with marketing, but it's um, the language that's used within the market marketing and the advertisement, um, more inviting language, um, maybe not like telling people what to do or um, yeah, just an open invitation more so as opposed to like, you need to do this, you need to do that. Just have a welcoming atmosphere for it. All right, thank you. Um, we do have a few minutes left, so I'm gonna go around one more time. Um, if any of our media partners have a question, um, Pranav, do you have another question? Um, yes. Um, so I heard um, friendship being mentioned as a factor that could contribute to uh, having a uh, good mental health. Um, and I was just wondering if the number of friends or how close of a friend circle a person has makes um, a difference in that. No, I say uh, quality over quantity, for sure. How well are these people supporting you? Um, yeah, like it, you can have 10, 20 people that you're connected with, but if there's no substance within that connection, then there's it's meaningless. Thank you. Thank you I'll for just, that. Oh, I'll just I'm add sorry, that research. Ahead. I'll just re add that research supports exactly what Maya said that quality over quantity is the determining factor. It's you trigger trigger finger. Um, let's go now to uh, Crystal. Do you have a follow up, Crystal? I do. Um, before I ask my question, I was wondering if Maya would be willing to share her last name with us, just so we have that spelling. It's Tatum, T-A-T-U-M. I can also put it on this, my name too. <laughs> Perfect, thank you so much. Um, and so my question is for Amy or Linda. We had talked before about the impact of um, mental health when they're younger and kind of how it translates when 
they get older. How is the shortage of counselors and therapists really impacting that? And how does that translate to now when they're at college? Well, the shortage of mental health professionals is definitely a problem. It's part of the reason that we really look well beyond um, uh, traditional mental health treatment as uh, the activities we need to be engaged in and why, you know, why we're looking at the broader at the social connectedness of youth, because we have a mental health professional shortage that isn't going to be um, fixed anytime soon. And we, so we have to think about kid time. It's one of the reasons that we um, focus a lot on what's happening in schools because um, the data tell us that 75% of kids who actually get some mental health treatment get it through school. And we know that as we work with educators on mental health literacy, give them space to uh, work with youth around mental health issues, and we support youth in terms of their ability to support their peers and themselves, that we're addressing the mental health issues that um, are important and hopefully you know, we avoid uh, kids slipping into a more serious mental health. Um, you know, another data point is that on average, uh, kids wait 11 years from the first symptoms of a mental illness to getting treatment. It's too long. We need, we need to address things right now. So we just look at, a, at it a broader, in a broader way we're looking at, and we look more at mental wellness. So looking at the whole package what do we do? How can we today help kids um, be resilient, think about um, inv investing in their brain health, as well as their physical health and their total wellness? And um, th that, you know, we just, we broaden the question because it's just so critical. Thank you. Uh, let's go now to Jeremy, Jeremy, do you have a follow-up question? Yeah, my question um, is really just, you know, looking at all of this data kind of for, for you guys, seeing that, is there anything as far as that stuck out surprising to you guys, or is this data kind of aligning what you guys have thought of before, you know, getting the full results of the, of the data? Amy, did you want to respond to that? Sorry, I'm, I thought your question was for the students. Um, we are, we're not um, completely surprised at the most recent data because as Linda mentioned earlier, the mental health um, crisis has been growing very steadily over time and it certainly predates COVID. So um, in that respect, it's not surprising to us um, what what is uh, hopeful is the growth of um, the peer led youth groups in schools as as we were talking about earlier and Andrea included a link to those um, you can see on the map on our on our web page where they're located and these have grown more recently um, the numbers are increasing each year so I think the emphasis on um, on helping kids, serving kids where they are in non-clinical settings is promising and hopeful. And so there has been a lot of momentum and activity focused on peer, um, peer support and school-based mental health. And I think that um, the, the pandemic funding around school-based mental health did, us, did help kind of build some of that momentum. So those are uh, not necessarily surprising trends, but um, I would say just rather hopeful. Thank you so much. You know, if I can just add um, to what Amy has been talking about, you know, today we're talking about college students and we know that the demand for mental health treatment on college campuses is much larger than what um, schools are able to provide. The, the good news about that is that our young people are talking about it. They're not afraid to step forward and ask for help. Um, so we're, you know, it's part of the reason we wanted to address this issue today because, um, because young people are, are ready to talk about it, to address their issues 
But, you know, if there isn't always a mental health professional for them to access, we wanted them to know that there are other things they can do to contribute to their wellness and their success um, at beating back the stress that college can lay on them. Thank you. Let's go now to uh, John. Do you have another question? Yes, thank you. And as far as just making friends in college, I remember, you know, I would just sort of walk down my dorm floor and, you know, when doors were open, you know, I made some great friends that way, just talking. It, James, you said you're mostly online. So I guess my question is for Maya, it, is that still occurring in school? I mean, in dorms, those first few years, critical years of college, are, are doors open or have things changed since I was in school a little bit? Yeah, so right now um, I'm a senior at Whitewater. I'm living in a, a one bedroom apartment, but the year before last, I was on the dorms. And just like you said, doors were open. Um, a lot of the resident assistants that, you know, like managed the halls really encouraged us to keep our doors open just to um, be invitational for those that are around us. Um, they're usually like um, hall meetings and stuff like that, that'll put us in spaces that would help cultivate you know, uh, enriching environment and um, just to immerse some friendships. I will say that schools are still doing that. And as an online student that, that didn't have a, a dorm network or an infrastructure like that, I had to find my own social avenues to, to make those connections. And I turned to really a lot of the career and technical student organizations. Uh, the one I, I really identified with was Future Business Leaders of America or FBOA. Uh, and, and FBOA, of course, it, its stated goal is helping to prepare future business leadership, but I found a, a very amazing community that of, of, of great friends who supported me and encouraged me and gave me opportunities to grow and, and lead and, and participate. And there, there's still some, some of the best friends that I've, I've made through college is, is in those groups. Uh, so even for, for students in online colleges or, or distance learning or, or other environments, there are opportunities for college students out there. There's just, a, it takes a bit more work to, to search them out and, and, and connect with them. That's great to hear. Thank you both. Thank you. And Samantha, do you have another question? Um, yes, just maybe what would your message be to parents who have, you know, potential concerns about their own child or college student? I know, like, I talk to my mom a lot throughout college, but if I was struggling, maybe she wasn't the person that I would want to call immediately because I wouldn't want to worry her. So, of course, younger generations are becoming more open to that, but what is your message to those parents who do have those concerns? In my case, uh, I, I really appreciated when my, my parents would, would celebrate my wins, my successes, but also when I had something that, that didn't go so well, hey, reassure me, say, you know, the, the world's not over. You'll get through this. You'll find a way. Get help get me back on track. Get me refocused. Those are the, the, the key elements of, of support that I think parents can really provide. I would say parents do not smother your kids. <laughs> Eventually we are gonna have to go out on our own and figure some things out by ourselves, right? It's not really by ourselves. Like James talked about, it's important for that validation, that reinsurance to come in every now and again. Um, but it is also important to um, help your child develop a little sorts of um, like independency. Thank you for that. And I think that that um, those are basically all the questions that we have. Did everyone get their questions asked who is on this call? We'll just open it up real quick. Is there anyone else who has a question that I did not call on? All right, well, with that, we do want to thank everyone for participating. We have final questions for Maya and James. You all have been so great throughout this. And we wanna know just if you have any final thoughts or tips you wanna suggest before we, before we end our call. I can go. Um, get connected, you're not alone. If you have social anxiety, is likely that the people around you also have social anxiety. So um, don't be afraid to just take that, that one little step that could really just, just ex excel you. Um, and yeah, find, find a club or an organization that really piques your interests. Um, 
those clubs and organizations are sometimes struggling to keep going. So it could be like just the participation of one more person, which could be you um, that could keep that organization going and in turn help other people and encourage others to get involved as well. And my advice is, is to own your college pathway, find what motivates you, find what excites you and chase that in, into your clubs, into your interests, into where you focus. And, and that those are the best areas where you'll find the best motivation, the, the best friends, uh, the best involvement and really the best outcomes. Thank you for that. And thank you to James and Maya and Amy and Linda and to all of you for joining us on this call. We appreciate it. Uh, the Office of Children's Mental Health webpage, um, web pages, a large list of hotlines and resources there for you. And of course, if you have additional questions, once you take a look at that, or we didn't get to today, just reach out to DHS Media and we will get you what you need. And we will be sending you a link to the entire video shortly. Uh, so thank you for participating and have a great afternoon.